world was shaken, my heart was broken, my hope was fading, the walls were closing, in. but now I'm singing, look how He lifted me. My life was sinking, my days were numbered, the waves were crashing, the flood was coming in. Oh, hallelujah, look how He lifted me. Oh, look how He lifted me. His grace and mercy is my testimony for every victory. I've got a song to sing. Look how He lifted me. He turned my weeping into a shout again And now I'm singing, look how He lifted me He rode my sorrows away at Calvary He rose in triumph over the enemy Oh hallelujah, look how He lifted me Look how He lifted me His grace and mercy is my testimony For every victory I've got a song to sing Look how He lifted me Stuff in love. 
נשאיר עליך. תינוקות חדשים, בהיבל דם בוכים, אפילו העצים, כפיים מוחאים, ים של מהללים, מקרב העמים, עם גדודי מלאכים, אלינו מסתעפים לשיר עליך. כל הנשמת הללויה, שירו ביחד הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, שירו ביחד הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, שירו ביחד הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, שירו ביחד הללויה. כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כולם ביחד הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, שיעור ביחד הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה, כל הנשמת הללויה שירו ביחד הללויה Amen. Praise the Lord. Indeed, let uh, everything that has breath praise the Lord. And uh, we are glad that we are in the house of the Lord. And we believe that the Lord is going to bless us. Uh, this morning, we are going to first discharge our younger kids. But before that, let's dedicate them to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning. We thank you for the privilege that you have given us. We thank you for the gift of life. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. That, Lord, you died on the cross for our lives. We thank you that, God, we have gathered here to worship you, Lord. To fellowship with each other, O oh God. And just to uh, seek your face, O oh God. We ask that your presence will dwell in us, O oh God. And, Lord, you minister to our lives. We thank you for our children. As they go to their Sunday school, O oh God, together with their teachers, we pray that, Lord, they will uh, find uh, a lot of joy. We pray that, God, they will get uh, uh, the knowledge that comes from you, O oh God. We pray that, Lord, you part them with great wisdom. And we pray for their teachers that you give them grace as they teach them, O oh God, so that, Lord, our children will be instructed in the way that, Lord, will bring glory to you. For this is the church, O oh God, that... Uh, we are bringing up, O oh God, for the sake of your kingdom. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, so we dismiss our young ones, ages 8 and below, as they 
live quietly. Uh, it's also another moment that the Lord has given us that we worship Him with our substances, our tithes and offering. Just to remind all of us and those that may not be aware, we have uh, our offering box, the offering box next to the entrance. So if you have not been able to do that, you may do that either as the service goes on or after. Uh, and also, I think the, there is also online platform where you can also give your offerings. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for such a moment like this. Lord, we worship you, Lord, with our substances, what God you have given us, oh God. We know that, Lord, we may not give um, that which may be too much, but, Lord, we give that which you have given us according to our abilities, oh God. We ask that, God, you bless us, oh God, every day. You continue expanding our territory, oh God, granting us, oh God, that which we can give back, oh God. We pray that, Lord, it may be used for the furtherance of your kingdom and that it may bring glory to your house, oh God. We thank you. We pray that you preserve us, oh God, preserve our lives, bless us, oh God, and our families. Bless, oh God, this land that we are standing on, oh God. Be exalted, Jehovah, and protect us from evil and all dangers. We thank you and we honor you for it. In the name of Yeshua, we pray all this trusting and believing. Amen. My name is Isaac Parashin. I had forgotten my name. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you.
Thou, O Lord. 
for thou oh lord art high above all the earth thou art exalted far above oh god say so worthy. Amen. So we exalt you this morning. We exalt you. Te exaltamos hoy, Señor, esta mañana. Tú eres digno, you are worthy. And we just want to shower you with our worship. As you're abiding in this place, you are here with us. We acknowledge you are here. We acknowledge you in this place. We acknowledge your presence in this place. And we just want to shower you with our adoration. We just want to shower you with our worship. Te queremos adorar, Señor. We just want to praise you. We just want to worship. We know that you are worthy. We see that you are holy. We see that you are holy. We see it, oh God. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We exalt you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let our praise be a fragrance to you this morning. Let it be sweet. Let it be so sweet unto you, O oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. How many of you know he's worthy? He's worthy to be exalted. He's worthy to be worshipped. Amen. <clears throat> Can we sing the Shema together? Shema Israel Adonai seated everyone
בוקר טוב, שבת שלום. My name is Ari. And my name is Christina. And we will be reading the weekly Bible readings today from the Torah, which is the Old Testament, the Prophets, and the New Testament. We have picked some verses from each section, and we will start with uh, Exodus 19, 1-6. ביום הזה באו מדבר סיני, ויישאו מרפידים, ויבואו מדבר סיני, ויחנו במדבר, ויחן שם ישראל נגד ההר. ומשה עלה אל האלוהים, ויקרא אליו אדוני מן ההר. לאמור, כה תאמר לבית יעקב, ותגיד לבני ישראל, אתם ראיתם אשר עשיתי למצרים, ואשא אתכם על כנפי נשרים, ואביא אתכם אליו. ועתה, אם שמעו אתו תשמעו בקולי, ושמרתם את בריתי, והייתם לי סגולה מכל העמים, כי לי כל הארץ. ואתם תהיו לי ממלכת כהנים, וגוי קדוש, אלה הדברים אשר תדבר אל בני ישראל. In the third month after בני ישראל had gone out of the land of Egypt, the same day they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there, right in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jack Jacob, and tell B'nai Israel, You have seen what I did to, Ed to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice, and keep my covenant, Then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to Bnei Israel. Amen. And uh, now we will be reading from the Haftarah. Uh, this week we will be reading from uh, Isaiah uh, 6, 8 to 11, and Isaiah 9, 5 to 6. We will start with... וישמע את כל אדוני, אומר את מי אשלח ומי אלך לנו ואומר, הנני אשלחנו ויאמר, לך ואמרת לעם הזה, שמעו שמוע ואל תבינו, יראו רעו ואל תדעו. אשמן לב העם הזה ואוזניו אכבד ועיניו אשה, פן יראה בעיניו ובאוזניו ישמע ולבבו יבין ושב ורפא לו, ואומר, עד מתי אדוני? ויאמר, עד אשר ימסעו הרים מעין יושב ובתים מעין אדם, והאדמה תישאה שממה. Then I heard the voice of Adonai saying, whom, sh whom should I send and who will go for us? So I said, Hineni, send me. Then he said, go, tell these people, hear without understanding and see without perceiving. Make the heart of these people fat, their ears heavy and their eyes blind, as they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Then I said, Adonai, how long? He answered, until cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. כי ילד ילד לנו בן ניתן לנו ותהי המשרה על שכמו ויקרא שמו פלא יועץ אל גיבור אביעד שר שלום למרבה המשרה ולשלום אין קץ על כיסא דוד ועל ממלכתו להכין אותו ולסעדה במשפט ובצדקה מעתה ועד עולם קנאת אדוני צבאות תעשה זאת For to us a child is born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. The zeal of Adonai Tsevaot will accomplish this. And because we believe in Yeshua, that he is our Messiah and Savior, we will be reading also a portion from the New Testament. We will be reading Matthew 8, 5 to 10. כאשר נכנס לכפר נחום, ניגש אליו שר מאה אחד 
והתחנן לפניו, אדוני, נערי שוכב בבית והוא משותק וסובל מאוד. אמר לו ישוע, אני אבוא וארבה אותו. השיב שר המאה ואמר, אדוני, אינני ראוי לכך שתבוא בצל קורתי. רק דבר דבר וירפא נערי. גם אני איש כפוף למרות וכפופים לי אנשי צבא. וכאשר אני אומר לזה, לך, הוא הולך. ולאחר בו הוא בא. ולעבדי עשה זאת, הוא עושה. שמע ישוע והתפלא, אמר אל ההולכים אחריו. אמן, אומר אני לכם, אצל שום איש בישראל לא מצאתי אמונה כזאת. Now when Yeshua came into Capernaum, a, a centurion came begging for help. Master, he said, my servant is lying at the home paralyzed, horribly tormented. Yeshua said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Master, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed, for I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now when Yeshua heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Amen, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Amen. אמן, תודה רבה, שבת שלום. שבת שלום. Thanks for worshiping with us here at King of Kings Community, Herzliya. Here's a little of what we'd like you to know this week. If this is your first time with us today, we hope you feel welcome. If you would like to get connected with us, I encourage you to fill out this connect card and drop it in the basket at the welcome table in the back so that someone from our team can reach out to you. Before service on Saturdays at 9 a.m., we have weekly prayer meetings downstairs in the Kingdom Kids room. The prayer room is the engine room for what God is doing in our community. We invite you to come, engage with God, and be part of asking God to move in our city. We are more than happy for you to keep your little ones with you in the service. If they do get a little fussy and they need a little break in order to serve you better, we provide a small nursery all the way downstairs past the Kingdom Kids room. This room is equipped with couches, a crib, toys, and a speaker so that you won't miss anything in the service. Junior high and high school groups will begin meeting again starting this Tuesday and will kick off with a combined youth launch party at the Arbogast home at 5.30. We can't wait to see you there. Community groups are the heartbeat of our congregational life. These Bible studies are places where we can grow in God and develop community life in a meaningful way. The Herzli of Petuach group meets on Monday at 7 p.m. at Mike and Jessica's house. And the Herzli of City Center group will meet this Wednesday at 7 p.m. at Matthew and Daniela's house. We encourage you to join. Contact us at kkch.org or the WhatsApp group if you're already a part for address and directions. Ladies, we invite you to our GLOW group meetings on Thursday mornings from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. here in this building. This group hosts women from all over the area, from different congregations that meet to study God's word, pray for one another, and grow in community. We hope to see you there this Thursday. We have a community bulletin in the back by the coffee station and information desk. This bulletin is for people in our congregation to post needs, opportunities, and other relevant and appropriate announcements for our community. Please save the date for our annual Purim party on Monday, March 6th. More details to follow. That wraps up the announcements for this week. As always, if you want to find out more, get in contact, watch our services online, or give online, visit kkch.org. At this time, we will also dismiss the older children ages 8 and up to their class upstairs. Enjoy the rest of the service, and we pray you meet God in a powerful way. Amen. Thank you, children, and thank you, Miss. Looks like Miss Jessica for taking care of the teaching our older children today. Good morning, everyone. Praise God! What a wonderful time of worship, and thank you uh, to our pastor who jumps in on the keys. How multi-talented! <laughs> I, I I know when I was away, he he jumped on the keys a few times, but. I didn't get to draw attention to it as I am going to be now, so great job. Thank you, Pastor. We really appreciate that. Well, we're going to be continuing in our story from Luke, so if you can, turn to Luke chapter 8. Also, another shout out to a couple of friends 
that are visiting with us today from Texas. Alex was help singing with us on the platform today. He's one of our old friends from Texas, uh, and we have another one who's uh, not feeling so well this morning, but she's visiting with us from Texas as well. And anyone who is visiting with us today for the first time, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining in worship with us together and exploring God's Word. Well, we're continuing, as uh, Pastor mentioned last week, we're continuing our series in Luke that we had maybe a year and a half ago that we began uh, and we're going to be continuing right where we left off in Luke. Now, for me, when I read the Gospels, I was telling someone the other day, when I read the stories of Yeshua, sometimes I, I have had a difficult time reading through them because sometimes for me, because I'm so familiar with the stories and, and the little snippets of Yeshua's life, it has in the past felt like, well, these are Yeshua's biggest hits. Oh, wow. Remember, remember when Yeshua did that? That was cool. Well, he died for my sins and rose again, and that's the part that really matters to me. But, yeah, remember all those cool miracles he did? Those are important. Isn't that something? And so what, what I'm trying to do now when I read the Gospels, uh, instead of looking at these passages and these miracles as cool stuff that Yeshua did back then, I'm trying to look at them as a story or as a narrative that Luke is trying to tell. See, Luke, the gospel writer, was a really good storyteller, and he knew how to pick the best parts of a story and put them together and not just list a bunch of facts that happened, but weave them together in like this body and this narrative that meant something. So when we read Luke or the gospels, we're not just reading about how cool Yeshua was. We're not just saying, oh, look at all the cool stuff he did. Wow, miracles, isn't, isn't that something? A good storyteller will take history and facts and things that happen and weave them together into a body and a narrative that has meaning. For example, my, my son likes to memorize facts. He's in second grade. And if I told him to just, I'm going to give him free reign of the Internet and you're going to tell me, give me a report on World War II. You're going to use Wikipedia and tell me, give me a, a good report on World War II. I'll probably let him go for an hour, and he'll, he loves dates. So he, he loves to memorize, like, dates of, of things that happen. So I'll probably give him an hour, and he'll come back and say, okay, Dad, here's my report. The war started in 1939. The war ended in 1945. The war started when Germany invaded Poland. The war was against the Allies and the Axis. The Holocaust was bad. There were major battles. Hitler was bad. Okay, good facts, all true, all history. But a historian, a good historian at least, may tell you about those battles kind of maybe by referencing the British spirit in World War II. A Brit Britain who was an island both in geography and topography, but also they're an island by themselves in the war against all of this fascism threat in Europe. So they're standing by themselves alone. And their spirit of the British people that stood up together, best embodied in their fearless leader, Winston Churchill, who gave the people the will and determination to fight for every inch of their beloved nation. We'll fight them on the beaches. Isn't that his famous speech? So you see how instead of talking about just facts of things that happened, a historian might give you the actual body of that narrative and, and help you be invested and, and find out what that means to us or why that's important to us. It's not just facts, it's his story. History, his story. So that's how Luke gives his history. And it's not just about facts of Yeshua's life. We need to see the narrative he was trying to tell, not just a bunch of miracles, but what those miracles meant for those Jewish listeners and multitudes that were watching at the time and what they mean to us today. So he doesn't just give us a history lesson in the Gospels. He gives us a picture of something that he wants his readers to grasp. He sees something happening right now. What is that thing happening? The king of Israel is taking his throne on the earth. The true king of Israel in this whole book that we're trying to read. The king of Israel is taking his throne, and that, this is what that looks like. Israel had no king at the time of Yeshua. They had an, an emperor who was a Gentile. They had kind of puppet 
leaders that were over them in Israel. But over and over, Yeshua is giving teaching, proclaiming the good news of a coming kingdom. When you see a kingdom, when, when someone starts saying, the kingdom is coming, my kingdom is coming, you, you, you start to think, well, okay, if a kingdom's coming, then a new king is coming. The emperor probably didn't like that very much when he started hearing about that. The Israelites would see a David figure coming back to Israel during a time when Israel had no king. So in the story so far about Luke, we've been demonstrating, he's been demonstrating that Yeshua is king, but that his rule and his kingdom is different than what we expected. So let, let me back up a little bit, a little bit of background. When he first started, Yeshua started demonstrating his kingly authority. A year and a half ago when we started this, I gave a message about his authority. When he began to teach the word of God, he spoke as one that had authority. That word authority, that means something kingly, someone that rules, someone that has power. Then he, he demonstrates his authority. People marveled at his authority over demons, people that had demons and were possessed by these false gods and, and, and had nasty stuff living inside of them. He spoke to the demon or spoke to a sickness or rebuked fever, and that thing left. That's a kingly thing that Yeshua was doing. Some miracles and, and things Healings happened in the Old Testament, but then Yeshua started doing things that they would only expect the Messianic king to do or happen in the Messianic age. Like blind eyes had never been healed before in the Old Testament. Lepers had never been healed in the Old Testament. These were prophecies of something that was supposed to happen when the Messiah comes. Oh, the lepers will be healed. Blind eyes will be opened. So now these things are happening with Yeshua and expectations are rising. Is he the one? He began to explain how his kingdom works with parables because what they were expecting was so far beyond what was coming, what Yeshua was bringing, that he had to use metaphors and parables to explain, my kingdom is like a sower who goes to sow seed. See, they, they expected Messiah to come and kill all the Romans. So Yeshua is having to uh, subvert their expectations and get them to start thinking the way his kingdom is. So Luke's been painting this picture using Yeshua's teaching and using Yeshua's miracles. And this chapter, what uh, Pastor uh, spoke on last week, began with Yeshua in a boat, in a storm on the sea. See, in Jewish thought, a storm w was the realm where um, a storm was the realm where God ruled over the storm. People didn't command storms. It just didn't happen. This is God's, the sea, that's God's thing. I, I'm going to stay away from that. Psalm 89, 9 says of God, God, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And here, Yeshua is standing up commanding the sea, rebuking the sea in God's territory. And the sea listens. People watching this were marveled and amazed. Here he is in God's territory, commanding something, and it's listening to him. Who is this guy? He has authority in a realm that only God should have authority. Last week, Pastor mentioned that, uh, that he lands in the Gadarenes in most likely a Gentile region. And there were pigs and, and unclean animals everywhere. And this demonic ambassador, demoniac ambassador comes out, possessed by this, the Jews thought at this time demons were like false gods, the spirits of false gods that were like ruling the area. So this guy was, the language that it portrays is that he was like an ambassador coming out to meet him in the Greek, coming out to meet the king and came out to him and squirming and saying, please, beg you for mercy. Don't throw me into the abyss. Asking Yeshua as like an underling would ask a king and beg for mercy. Please don't exert your power. I don't want to go into the abyss. Please send me over there. I know you have the power to do whatever you want, but please. This begging, and the disciples see this, even the Gentiles and their gods are cowering and falling under the power of this guy's authority. So this is the picture being painted. Yeshua is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and then the actions and the miracles and the teaching he's giving are actually asserting that power and the authority he has as king. So let's read 
where we left off last week, starting in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. If I could find it. So he leaves the demon-possessed man, and by the way, when he leaves the demon-possessed man, he says to him, go tell everyone what God has done for you. And the next verse it says, so he went around telling them what Yeshua has done for them. But Luke's painting a picture there and, and making God is working in and through this person of Yeshua. It's pretty cool. So starting in verse 10, uh, 40, uh, Luke chapter 8. Now when Yeshua returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Yeshua's feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Yeshua was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up from behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Yeshua asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding you and pressing against you. Yeshua said, Somebody touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman says, saying that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people, told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So a leader of the synagogue says, my girl's dying, please. They add the detail that she's 12 years old. That's an important number. That's a signpost number. Keep that in mind. So on the way to going to heal this daughter, he's being, Yeshua's being crowded by the crowd, and there's a woman that's introduced that's been suffering from bleeding, probably a feminine bleeding, for about 12 years. Again, 12 years, that's, that's an important number. That's a signpost number. Keep that one in mind. According to the Torah, a woman during her monthly time is ritually unclean. Anyone who touches her, uh, anything she sits on or lays on is unclean. She's not sinful. She's not worthless. She's just ritually unclean. It's just how it is. Stay away from her. After the time where uh, her time is up, then she does an immersion in water, a mikveh, and she is clean, and she can go on with her life. This woman had not been bleeding for a few days, but had been bleeding for 12 years straight. 12 years. Doctors could not cure her. She spent everything she had. If she had had a husband at the time, basically her husband could not touch her after 12, for 12 years. Most likely, if she had had a husband, her husband would probably put her away and unfortunately divorce her. She could not use the same furniture as anyone else. So very likely, no one could live in the same house with her. She was probably alone for 12 years. She spent all of her money. If she had an inheritance from her parents or her grandparents, that money was gone. She was poor. She had little to no opportunity to work. What could she do? She was unclean. She couldn't touch anything. She was so desperate. Sometimes people are desperate. Who's ever been desperate before? <laughs> Sometimes people are desperate, and it leads them to making stupid decisions. Ever been there? There's a character from a TV show. I won't say what it is, but there's a character from a TV show that, a comedy that went through a, a really comical breakup and divorce. Uh, uh, not breakup. He broke up with his girlfriend, and they interviewed him, and he said, what's it like being single? I like it. I like starting every day with a sense of possibility. And I'm optimistic because every day I get a little more desperate. And desperate situations yield the quickest results. <laughs> desperate situations yield the quickest results. That's not always the best result, but when you're desperate, sometimes you get pushed in the corner and you do something stupid. Sometimes you get desperate like Sarah was in the Old Testament, who was so desperate to have a son Instead of trusting God for a miracle, she tried to make it happen for herself and gave her handmaiden, Hagar, uh, to Abraham, said, fine, have a son with her. We need this promise. We need, I need to have a son. It didn't turn out so good for anybody. Nobody won in that situation. That's not the kind of desperate God's looking for. You see, desperation must be mixed with faith. 
We can't just be desperate and say, oh, God, I, I'm never going to, you're never going to help me with this. Oh, see, it's a mixed drink. We have to mix our desperation for God with faith. We need to be desperate God, for God to move, but we have to actually believe that God will answer that cry. Amen? You have to believe and trust in who he says he is. That, like David says, uh, uh, the, the broken and contrite heart, God will not deny. He will not despise the broken and contrite heart. When you come to him with a brokenness and, and desperation, we actually have to believe that he's going to come through and not lead us to desolation and hopelessness. We have a hope. You have to believe in Yeshua's value system where he said a few chapters ago, blessed are the poor in spirit, the desperate, the broken, because theirs is the kingdom. You have to actually believe that second part of the thing. Yes, be broken in spirit, be desperate. We need that. But you have to actually believe that you're going to inherit, you're going to grab onto the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God and his resources are going to be there for you. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to, believe, uh, to please God because anyone who comes to him must actually believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Some people believe, think this is faith. Well, I believe that he's able. I believe he's out there and he can do it for me. He knows where I am if he wants to, he, if he wants to work for my behalf. That's not faith. That's, that, that's nothing. The Bible says that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You aft, at, that desperation has to actually lead to you seeking God like this woman did. We must be desperate, but desperation must move us into faith, and faith acts. Yeshua was always moved by compassion towards the desperate, but he was impressed by faith. Maybe you say, I don't have enough faith. Yes, yes, you do. We all have a measure of faith that God gives us as a gift. It's just that sometimes we invest our faith into something that disappoints us. We invest our faith into the negative. We invest our faith into a lie and worry and anxiety instead of investing it into hope in God. This woman in, this, in the story could have been disappointed in all the years that she had hoped on doctors and wasted on doctors. She could have sat in her room as Yeshua was passing by and said, oh, there goes the king. I believe he's king. I believe he has, he's king over all those diseases and he can command demons and uncleanliness of others, but he can come and fix me if he want. No, her desperation influenced her to take action. She didn't sit in her room. She came out. She found him. She grabbed hold of the tassels of the king. She grabbed hold of the king himself. And by grabbing hold of the king, she grabbed hold of the kingdom and all that resource. See, this is important to the story because it's teaching us something about the kind of king Yeshua is and the kind of power his kingdom brings. She came up behind him. She grabbed onto his tassels, probably like the, the tzitzit of, of his garment. You've seen... Uh, many religious Jewish people wear the, the tassels on their garments. Sometimes you can see them outside. And she probably grabbed onto that tassel, just a little bit of that tassel, and grabbed onto it. And immediately her bleeding stopped. So in the law, if you touch an unclean person, you become unclean. The uncleanliness transfers to, that clean, to, to the clean person. If, if I touched a bleeding woman at that time, if I touched a bleeding woman like that, then I would have to go actually rinse myself and, and get cleanliness myself. But he says, someone touched me. I know that power has gone from me. The uncleanliness doesn't transfer to the woman to Yeshua in the story. Instead, Yeshua's kingly power transfers from Yeshua to the woman, and she is made clean. So in the law, uncleanliness transfers to the clean person. In Yeshua, his power transferred to her and overcame that uncleanliness. Twelve years. It wasn't just that Yeshua healed her. It's the way he healed her. His power as king was a substance in him and on his person. And that substance 
transferred and was transferable to her. And it overwhelmed her and her uncleanliness and all the law that required of that uncleanliness. Hebrews 8, 2 says it this way. His law, Yeshua's law, his, as king, you know, kings make laws. That's generally what they do. His law of, is the spirit of life. And that law of the spirit of life set her free from the law of sin and death and the righteous requirement that the law might be fully met. Power transfer. What happened? The power of the king, it's like that power of the king expanded. When she grabbed that hem of his garment, it's like she opened the door of her own kingdom, of her own heart, of her own body, of everything in faith and said, I'm opening the door. And then the power of the king just expanded into another territory. He conquered, that power conquered another piece of land. He, Yeshua's power says, this body is mine. This woman is now in my domain. And in the king's domain, in the kingdom, we don't bleed like that. Bleeding has to stop. When that power came into her, she became part of his kingdom and part of his domain. And in his domain, bleeding doesn't happen like that. And how did it happen? She believed. She opened the door. What did he say? Your faith has healed you. Your faith has opened the door. Go in peace. Go in wholeness. Let's keep reading. Starting in verse 49. So while Yeshua was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Yeshua said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Again, believe. Open that door of faith. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, and James, Jacob, the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead but asleep. They laughed at Yeshua, knowing that she was dead. But he looked up at her and said, uh, uh, he took her up by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Yeshua told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Remember, the, the woman was a, a side project. She was, she was an interruption on, on his way to do something important. Poor little 12-year-old girl was dying. He's, he stopped in the middle of going to this very important meeting. Who's touching me? Who, the, the dad's probably like, come on, man. I, who cares who touched you? Let's, let's go. This is kind of important. This is urgent. After the whole fiasco with the woman, the message comes that the little girl's dead. Forget it. Just, just go home. It's too late. Yeshua encourages the father, holding this faith up again, says, don't be afraid. Just believe. He goes into the room where the mourners are expressing their appropriate grief, and he doesn't go in there with a the sensitivity that I hope to go into a room where someone has just died, especially a little girl. Oh, God bless you. I'm so sorry. You know what? I'm just, we're here for you, we're praying for you, we're going to get you all the meals you need. Yeshua comes in there like a bull in a china shop and starts making commands. Hey, be quiet, stop crying. You crying? Stop, stop, stop that crying. Wipe that tear from your eye. Where, where, where does this guy get off? He, he starts making commands. He says, no, 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 she's not asleep. She's not, she's not, she's not dead. She's, not, she's just asleep. How uncomfortable I would feel in that situation where this man that I now assume is psychotic comes into the room where my child has just died and starts making commands and telling the people that are crying to shut up and, and telling us about, who are you, man? I would be so uncomfortable that I might laugh too. I might laugh at the whole situation. What is happening here? It's an uncomfortable thing. And Yeshua doesn't care, apparently, what we think about his methods. But he reaches to touch the hand of the dead girl. And once again, if you touch a dead body, you become unclean. If you accidentally touch a dead body, you have to go uh, do a cleansing ceremony and get 
ashes from the red heifer sprinkled on you until you can go into the temple again. So once again, Yeshua touched an unclean thing, a dead body. But when Yeshua touches her hand, gives this command, her spirit returns, and she stands back up. Again, the king's command, the law of life, set this little girl free from the law of death that hold her. The uncleanliness of the girl didn't transfer to Yeshua. His command transferred life back into her account and to the little 12-year-old girl. So what's the piece of this story here? Where does this fit into the big story? This is not just to say, ooh, ah, Yeshua was cool. Look at that. That's something. He can clear up blood and he can raise the dead. I remember, I don't know if you've ever read the book, uh, the Narnia. Anyone ever read the Narnia books? At least, or at least seen the movie, maybe, if you like me and don't like to read books. Uh, at least seen the book, or just the first movie, The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe. There was this white witch, and she had this dominion over the kingdom of Narnia. It was winter for a hundred years. All of her enemies, she would turn to stone just by zapping them with her wand. And then the true king of Narnia returns, Aslan, the lion. And there's this rumors that he's returned to the land, and, and there's evidence that he's returning because the, the winter starts to melt into spring. Things don't work so well anymore for the, the witch. Some of these stone figures that she's turned into stone start melting and turning back into the animals or mythical creatures or whatever they were. Breathes life onto the stone and brings them to life. It's a very classic story of a king returning, and as he returns, things start melting for that other kingdom. And, and kind of crumbling, and, and that kingdom starts to come and overwhelm that bad witch kingdom. That's the, res- the story we're being told here of a return of a king. Israel, who had had no king, as I said at the beginning, was waiting for the promised king to come. And this man, Yeshua, comes wielding power and authority that they would expect that that promised king to yield. And power even beyond what they expect. Luke is building this expectation as Yeshua is doing more and more with this raw power and this raw authority and explaining how this power works and explaining how his kingdom works. And we're led to expect that as the king is conquering territory, soon the king is going to be taking his throne. The story today wants us to see the king and how differently the kingdom power works. So number one, in the normal law, if you touch something unclean, you become unclean. And you know what? That principle still applies. Uh, It generally holds true in our lives today. If you do unclean things, it's going to mess you up. Sin is sin. It doesn't reverse that way. It doesn't reverse that way in the kingdom. If you say or watch or think about or do unclean things, it messes with your mind. It messes with your body and soul. Sometimes we don't reverse the kingdom of God that way. You don't start watching something unclean and then because I'm in the kingdom, the people are going to start putting their clothes back on. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't start smoking, and smoking ter- becomes good for you. It becomes a rose in your hand. No, it, it's still bad. Bad stuff is still bad for you. But in God's kingdom, there is a reversal in us when we encounter the power of God. When Yeshua touches or is touched by a sinful woman, or someone with an unclean spirit, or a leper, or bleeding woman, or even a corpse, he doesn't become unclean. His power comes out to make them clean. His power can come out to make you clean. He is king, and his power is invasive. I want you to hear that point. He is king, and his power is invasive. It's greater than you think. It's powerful enough to overwhelm Everything, everything, his power is greater. Well, no, he can do it. He can, no, it is greater than anything. I need you to hear that point because sometimes we, we set stuff aside, say, yeah, he can. Yeah, it's, it's possible. You don't even know what is possible in the realm of God's authority and God's power. So number one, he is king and his power is more invasive than you think. Number two, this power is transferable. It's something that that he can give away or or that we can all access. This thing that Yeshua, King Yeshua, rules over, his kingdom, it can extend to you. It can extend to everyone. 
And, and his power can overwhelm you. Luke 16, 16 says, Since the time of John, the good news of the kingdom is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. How are they forcing their way into it? They're coming to the point, like this woman that was healed, of desperation. People need to be saved. You come to the, we, many of us have come to this point in our lives where we, we're desperate. We know that we need to be saved by God. We come to this point of realization that we need the Lord. And we need him not just to save us, but to rule over us. We need him to take us. So we come to that point of desperation mixed with faith in who he is and what he can do. We are invited in this story to grab out and reach him in desperation and faith. Grab hold of him like that woman did and allow his power to invade and conquer us. He wants to be your king and he wants his power to be your power. The number 12 kept coming up and we're almost finished. The number 12 kept coming up. For Israel, 12 was an important number. Does anyone know one of the most important things about the number? 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. Does anyone know all the 12 tribes? Don't ask me. I, I don't have them memorized. <laughs> Naphtali, Gad, Benjamin, Benjamin Judah, Judah, Dan, Manasseh, I, I, Levi. Levi is a good one, yeah. Um, Ephraim. I've, I know there's a few. Is Bartholomew? Oh, no, that was a disciple. I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Twelve, well, exactly. Twelve is the number of tribes. It's the number of governmental authority in Israel. And Luke sees this detail in these stories when he writes, and he drops this number, 12. 12 years she dealt with this. The girl was 12 years old. And I hope it's not a stretch to bridge this to actually the very next thing Luke says in Luke chapter 9. After the woman was healed and after the 12-year-old girl was healed, chapter 9, verse 1 says, Then Yeshua, when Yeshua had called the 12 together, what did he do? He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim what? the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them to take nothing for the journey, no bag, no staff, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever you, house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave, uh, leave the town, shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. This power is transferable. The kingdom is is expanding to us. The very next verse actually plays it against this king theme again. He says, now Herod, the Tetrarch, he doesn't call him king, now Herod heard about what was going on. Uh-oh. <laughs> the king's probably going to get upset here. <laughs> Someone's kingdom's being threatened. Yeshua is now starting to give this power out freely and his authority out freely to others, transferring his power to the 12 so that the 12 can be part of the king's conquest to announce his kingdom different than expected. Destroy the works of the enemy, demons, sickness, and disease. It's not, for, not to heal them this time. It's actually to give away. Another uh, version of the story says, what you've been given freely, freely give away. I'm giving you my power and authority. Put that power in others. Transfer that power. Heal the sick. Drive out demons. Expand this kingdom. We're going to start on this next week uh, when we go over this uh, chapter 9, or maybe it's the week after. I don't know what Pastor Chad's preaching on. But when we start this next time, we're going to see him building up this transfer power to 12 ordinary people, and then soon it'll be spread out to 70 ordinary people. And then at last, inviting us to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We're invited to share into this power. He is king, and his power is bigger and more invasive than we could ever imagine. He wants to be your king, 
and he wants his power to be your power. Can we stand? I pray you grasped what, what this author was trying to, to get across to us today, that these are not just some cool miracles that Yeshua did 2,000 plus years ago. We are invited as the reader to grab onto the hem of his garment, to believe like that father believed, open up in faith and to pull on his kingdom, to pull on his resources, to pull on his healing, to pull on his power to make us clean and his power to transfer and to spread and, and, and to give his kingdom out to others. We're not just sitting here reading the story. We're in the story. We're jumping in. We have the opportunity, like this woman, to display desperation and not only desperation, desperation mixed with belief, need mixed with faith. Father God, we need you today. We are in desperate need of you. I am in desperate need of you. Lord, anything that we try to do in our own power, in our own strength, is going to fall, it's going to crumble, and it's going to burn. We, we understand that, God. We need you. We need your rule. We need your kingdom that will not be shaken. Your kingdom that will remain forever and ever. We need to be under the rule of the king. Lord, we ask you, God, to let us see our need of you. Help us, God, to even be desperate for you in places that we need to be desperate and see the places we need to be desperate in our lives and in our families and as a congregation and as a body. But, Lord, we pray for the spirit and the, even the gift of faith that would sweep through this room that we would know how much that you can do when we ask you, that we have confidence and faith, that when we ask you and come before you humbly, that you are going to meet us at the point of our need and even beyond the point of our need to the point where it's overflowing from us and that we're having to give it out to others. Lord, let your power flow in this room today. Let your power flow in all of us. We grab the hem of your garment. We grab the tassels of your coat. And we ask for that power, God. That we would receive power when the Holy Spirit would come upon us. As Yeshua said before he left this earth. That we would be his witnesses to the kingdom. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And unto the ends of the earth. Give us your power, God. Give us your holiness and your power. Pour out your Holy Spirit, we ask you. I invite you just to ask him as well. Just in your own way. Ask the Lord. Maybe you want to be silent. Maybe you want to call out. Lord, we are desperate. Pour out your power on your people. Pour out your power on King of Kings Community Herzliya. Pour out your power on our embassy. Pour out your power on my place of work, God. Pour out your power on my family, on my husband, on my wife. Pour out your power on my children. Pour out your power, Lord, so that I can be a light to my university and take your kingdom to the university, God. Pour out your power, Lord. Pour out your power on me, God. Pour out your power on us. We need you, Lord. We need you, God. Meet us, oh God. Let's be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Let us not try to do anything outside of your realm, outside of your dominion. Let's be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God and what you are wanting to do. If anyone in this place needs healing in any part of their body or in any part of their mind or emotions, I want you just to humbly, and I know it's embarrassing sometimes to do, but just as an act of faith, I want you to raise your hand in a point of desperation. And we don't have to keep our eyes closed I, I, because I, I want people around, anyone with their hands raised, I want you to lay hands on those that, that are sick or in pain 
So if there's anyone around you, you have to look around and, and see. If there's anyone in pain, raise them high. If, you, if you're having a sickness of any kind, I want you to raise your hands. And we're going to pray for these people. And I want us to pray with authority. I want us to grow as a congregation. I want us to pray not just, well, Lord, whatever your will is, let it be done. I, I want you to actually pull on faith and, and resources from God that he can do it. Your kingdom can overwhelm sickness. Your kingdom can overwhelm mental anguish or, or emotional pain. Your, 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 your kingdom can do it. Your power can do it. You are invasive. So, Lord, we pray right now for these people, Lord. We deliver them to you, to your kingdom, God. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let, let it be like on earth as it is in heaven, God. Overwhelm bodies right now. Overwhelm pain in back. Overwhelm pain Lord, in the midsections, God. Lord, over, overwhelm lies and things in, in the mind that have cluttered up. Anxiety, Father. Lord, let those things lift right now in the name of Yeshua. Let pain just drop out of the body as your kingdom comes and overwhelms in Yeshua's name. Lord, we draw on power from you, God, and we have power from you, God. We believe this, God. We have been given this power by your precious Holy Spirit. Lord, we release that power into these bodies today. We ask you to come. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit. We ask you to come, Lord. Overwhelm. Fire, God. Fire, burn everything that can be burned. Burn everything that is not of your kingdom, God. Burn everything that is unwholesome, Lord. Burn everything that is against your peace, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Bring healing. Bring your healing, Lord. Just as you did in the days of Yeshua and the disciples. Bring your healing to this room today in Yeshua's name. Because you're good and because you want to demonstrate that you're king. Bring your healing in this place in Yeshua's name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hey, Lord, bring your healing, God. In a moment, in a moment, Father. Thank you, Father. Just a testimony. Last year, um, last year my, um, my mother had fallen. She lives in Texas, and she was walking her dog and saw a snake on, on the path and tried to step around to avoid it and stepped in some mud and fell and hurt her knee very badly. It swole up. And she had to go to the um, doctor and do whatever, MRIs or, or X-rays on it and go to therapy and everything. And here in the congregation, someone, uh, God used someone to actually come up and give a word and said, someone's got knee pain uh, in, in the room right now. And I, God, God is showing me that he has knee pain. And I just want you, we're not going to lay hands on you. I don't feel led to lay hands on you. I just want you to put your hand on your knee and that swelling will go down. No one seemed to respond in the room. It was, <laughs> it was like, okay, well. Thanks, you can sit down now. A few weeks later, my mom watched the, the live stream, and I didn't even make the connection to my mom at all. My mom watched the live stream. She put her hand on her knee, and that swelling went, she canceled her MRI appointment. She canceled the therapy. The swelling went down immediately as the kingdom of God. She pulled on that faith in the kingdom of God and his power, and that thing overwhelmed her knee. The pain went away. She canceled everything. It was amazing. God has that same power to do it, and obviously it works across distances. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> we pray, Lord, for healing wholeness in every body, every mind, every spirit. And Lord, that the Spirit of God would be on us like it was on the 12 and on the 70 and on the 120, God. That your power would be in us, God. And that we would have the gall and authority and the audacity to use it. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Let me bless you as you go. Oh, Father God. Forgive me. I get a little excited. <laughs> Father, we pray that you bless them, keep them, make your face shine upon them. Lord, be gracious to them and give them your shalom, your peace, your wholeness, shalem, in Yeshua's name.
Amen. Pastor has something. Praise God. Thank you, Matthew. Powerful sermon. Appreciate that. Uh, he mentioned already that next week we have Pastor Chad coming. Uh, pastor Chad is the senior pastor of King of Kings Community Jerusalem, CEO of King of Kings Ministries. Um, he's coming for a special reason, occasion. We actually have a very special uh, Saturday next week, which I wanted to uh, know about uh, and be excited about. Uh, we're going to install Matthew uh, as an official pastor here at the congregation. So um, he's been serving at uh, this congregation uh, ever since, when did you come? 2019. Uh, so over four years and served already as, as an elder, uh, basically as a pastor as well. Uh, you won't feel any difference uh, from next week on. We just want to, and this is how we roll. Um, I said last few weeks ago, um, once you're in the role, once you serve in that position, you, you get the title. Um, but we're not giving the title and then see how we get you into the role and, and actively working. So uh, what we want from you is uh, still want to give you another week of just affirming that decision. Uh, we want you to be part of this. And then uh, next week, uh, Pastor Chad is uh, going to be with us. He, he will be preaching and we'll install uh, Matthew as, as a pastor and just celebrate with him and uh, Daniela together. So... Be excited for that, and um, have a wonderful Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Hopefully the sun is coming out a little bit more, and uh, have a great week. Bye-bye.